Leila. Oh. <laughs> okay. Good afternoon, everybody. Thanks for patience and um, okay. So I'm going to talk about uh, the monsoon in a warming climate. But I, I will first uh, do some review on what we have seen this week. No? All right, put my spare time. Now? Better? Okay. Okay, so. I want to thank also uh, my collaborator, Charles, and uh, Tessa, who also provides some of the data I'm going to discuss, Marcia Zilli, Rodrigo Bombardi, uh, all my students, and also Professor Maria Sonsão Silva. <laughs> so uh, the questions that I, I'd like to discuss today is basically that we see that the tropical South America has been warming. Um, and the question is, is the monsoon changing? Um, and also, if yeah, yes, can we, we detect those changes based on observations, not models, um, using instrumental data? And, uh, and I also want to answer if there are regional uh, uh, differences in this change and what mechanisms uh, drive this change. So but I, I will start just reviewing uh, what a monsoon is, and I'm going to use the idea of Zhao Enlao, uh, 1998, who uh, I think it was one of the first papers that discussed the existence of the monsoon. What he did, he, uh, they discussed, the, 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 they removed the uh, mean, so just to emphasize the seasonality of the winds and circulation and found the monsoon. So I'm going to do the same thing. Uh, so you see in color, you see uh, precipitation. But the winds now, uh, they are actually anomalies or seasonal anomalies. So we're going to see uh, the, where, where the major differences are. And I hope this works, but I think it will. So um, now we're starting in, in October. Then you can see, uh, by this time, you see uh, the anomalous cyclonic circulation being formed over the ocean. By uh, uh, November, we see that this anomalous circulation moves towards uh, southeast Brazil. And by this time, we see also something very important, that is cross-hemispherical flow uh, to the southern hemisphere. We also see the westerlies. Remember, people uh, talk about Manuel Gunn, Alice, talk about the westerlies in this area. And then we see the organization of a South Atlantic convergence zone. Um, in, in December, uh, the, uh, this, the circulation is still uh, uh, becoming stronger, this anomalous circulation. And then we start seeing also the cross-hemispherical uh, uh, flow becoming stronger in the equatorial uh, region. Uh, the SACZ is present. By January, you have the peak of the monsoon with most of the precipitation occurring uh, near 20 south, uh, south of, uh, of the equator. Um, and you see the intensification, the presence of the, uh, this uh, cyclonic anomaly over southeastern Brazil, so over the continent. Um, by uh, February, then we start seeing the, the uh, weakening of convection, and the cyclonic circulation moves a little over central uh, Brazil. This is a very important feature because this is going to actually induce to the end of the monsoon. Um, and by uh, 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 March, we start seeing uh, this, this intensification of this, this anomalous circulation and then more convergence uh, around five uh, north, uh, south. 
Um, as time goes by, then we start seeing the increasing the convergence near the equator, and then this is when uh, we start getting more of the easterlies, anomalies, seasonal anomalies here in this area, and then convection moves to the northern hemisphere uh, by May, um, June, uh, July, um, and August. We have then the end of the monsoon. And September is uh, also interesting because you see the enhancement of convection over southern Brazil. Uh, Alice talked a little about this uh, during her presentations, and also the increase in the conversions uh, already moving towards the still at the uh, northern hemisphere. And I guess it's okay. So. Uh, <coughs> What is another important feature we talked about this week was the, the South American low-level jet, uh, which is very important in transporting moisture uh, from, from uh, uh, the ocean towards the, and also from the Amazon where you have evapotranspiration uh, and bringing this moisture to the uh, uh, subtropic, subtropical South America. Um, now, I want to talk a little bit about the uh, variability of the monsoon. Um, and I will start talking about the synoptic to subseasonal variability of the monsoon has been topic that Alice is going to discuss tomorrow. I just want to show some of the, uh, to give an idea what this means. We talk about the active and break phases of the monsoon. Uh, and here what I did, I just uh, selected the synoptic scale. This was done by filtering an index. We'll talk about this index later. Uh, but uh, we can see that this is basically the climato uh, the, the uh, mean uh, of the, during the active phases, this is precipitation from tree, and during the break phases. And this is the difference between the two. And then if you remember early in the week, I think it was Irasema who was talking about, and Alicia later, uh, that this pattern of changes you have, uh, when you have enhanced convection over the IC SACZ, you have uh, decreased convection over Northwest Amazon and Southern, Southeastern uh, South America. <coughs> uh, and also you have another source of variability that's very important, which is the variability driven by the low level jet. Here I'm showing the climatology uh, of these uh, the precipitation and winds. And here is when the, the jet is strong. I'm based this on cases that uh, uh, Montine et al. have selected. And then you can see very clearly when you see the differences, you see the enhancement of convection over uh, south, southeastern uh, South America and, uh, and a decrease in convection over tropical South America. This is very different from this pattern we see here. So talking about different mechanisms driving this variability in the monsoon. Uh, we talk about intraseasonal variability, which uh, Alice spent some time talking about this. I'm not going to go through this again. We see a similar pattern when we are looking at subseasonal. It's similar to uh, when you are talking about synoptic scale variability. Um, and then this is two composites. Uh, when you have enhanced SACZ, when you have weak SACZ, uh, and then you see also, again, the pattern that I just showed. Uh, uh, of, uh, of uh, uh, the, this di dipole uh, in precipitation and also with Northwest uh, South America. Uh, this is related to the propagation of wave trains um, uh, that we have seen different phases of this wave train seem to modulate uh, this active or this enhanced and weak SACs. Okay. All these mechanisms have been discussed. I'm just summarizing because we, we want to talk about changes in the monsoon. And just, just a summary. So what influences the uh, 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 monsoon? What are the couple modes that uh, play a role for the variability of the monsoon? We talked a lot about the Niños and uh, uh, Southern Oscillation. This is just a summary, one of the figures we have seen. And then this is uh, where Enso has the strongest teleconnections, teleconnections that change according to the season. It's just a, 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 um, a summary that's also published in Green and, and Breezy. Uh, and this uh, showing uh, this vision. But I also want to point out that uh, ENSO is also important in modulating 
the extreme precipitation in the South Atlantic convergence zone. This is, has been shown before. More than the mean precipitation, it also modulates extreme precipitation. So ESO is, is the most important mode of international variability. ESO also influences the jet, uh, the low-level jet. This is also in Montini et al., uh, 2019. Uh, and uh, he is just showing the September, October, November um, uh, composites doing uh, just a El Nino minus neutral year, just to show the influence of El Nino. Um, in, 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 the, in the spring and in the summer. Um, and then you can see uh, very clearly things change from spring to summer, uh, even with respect to the jet. So you have a stronger jet pretty much in the spring, but in the summer things are very uh, different. And those are only, they are composites of IVT uh, during south jet uh, days uh, that were selected based on uh, uh, Montini's um, methodology. Uh, this is the same for La Nina, and then you can see uh, 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 different patterns actually important for the behavior of the jet. Now, not an important mode, we haven't talked much about it uh, in this, in this um, uh, workshop, is the Atl Atlantic dipole. The Atlantic dipole has been found before uh, it's basically um, <coughs> characterized by this dipole in, in uh, temperature in the uh, South Atlantic uh, between the equator and, uh, and uh, mid latitudes. Um, and this has been important also in modulate. It has a, a, a decadal variability, but also an interannual variability that's important. What I'm showing here is a result in Bombardier et al. He shows the importance of this mode on interannual time scale. And then he, he show, they show that uh, when you have uh, uh, this phase, when you have cool uh, sea surface temperatures um, in the tropical area, you have enhanced SACC. And the opposite when you have uh, uh, warmer uh, sea surface temperatures. And this is a very interesting because it's interannual time scale. Uh, this is, oh, by the way, this is, uh, all these composites were done during neutral year because we know that the Atlantic talks to the Pacific, uh, and then during El Nino years, this could be just basically the effect of ENSO. Now, uh, so you have in this cool tropical uh, mode, you have stronger anticyclonic circulation, you have a stronger convergence in the northern flank of the SACZ, and then you have enhanced precipitation in the SACZ explaining uh, this, this variability, okay? Uh, this is also another uh, way of looking. This is based on station data. Uh, doesn't mean there is no, no relationship over here. It's just the fact that we have many more stations in these areas. But it's showing these uh, 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 differences based on, on um, the, the South Atlantic dipole mode. You can clearly see the importance of this for precipitation in the uh, southeastern South America, south, southeastern South America. Now, if you look at the trends of this uh, uh, index, uh, this is just, a, I took this from the internet, so uh, these trends in the tropical Atlantic SST, and you see there is a positive trend at the moment, so in the, the, the last, uh, since 1948. Okay. The other mode we talked a lot about today um, in the morning and yesterday uh, in the talk um, by Barrera and Cayano this morning, the influence of the AMO. Okay. So the AMO is a natural mode of variability um, in the Atlantic, uh, and it has a positive and negative phase uh, about six to eight years period. Um, and it, roughly speaking, had a positive phase in 1924 to 1965, negative 1966 to 1996. So this mode has been demonstrated to be important in modulating the monsoon on, on longer time scale. Uh, several studies have shown that um, significant influencing in this uh, uh, in the monsoon and precipitation of East Brazil, and uh, maybe talk a lot about this in the morning. Um, and, but also, if you look at uh, 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 paleo data, I don't know if Pedro is going to talk about this, but uh, from paleo record, they have found 
like this is a sediment uh, record in this region. They have found a very interesting signature in the power spectrum between 64 and 61 year, years. Um, uh, and also indicating that the SACZ was uh, uh, more uh, stronger uh, and then there, were, there is more deposit of sediments in the ocean that can be related to this uh, temporal scale. They also look at spaleothemes in caves and also find, found the AMO signal in the paleo records. Now, the question is, is the AMO also related to the jet? Because we talk about precipitation, but what is the mechanism that actually drives this differences? And one hypothesis that we, we tested was that, okay, the AMO may be also important for variations in the, in the jet. Um, and then what was done, so this is a paper, uh, that uh, recent paper, um, that we, we look at uh, this using the European uh, uh, medium range weather forecasting analysis for the 20th century, the area 20C. Uh, and we look into this so that we have a long time scales because you, we are looking at multi decadal time scales. We don't have reanalysis, uh, except this is an area 20C. Uh, that assimilates only surface and mean sea, uh, sea level pressure, surface marine wind observation. So it's a limited thing, but actually showed uh, interesting results. The question is, how reliable is this sort of reanalysis that is very uh, uh, coarse resolution or have uh, limitations in assimilation? So um, here is a, a comparison uh, with radio sounds uh, at two key locations for the jet, one is Santa Cruz, the other one is Mariscal. Mariscal. And then here's just comparing uh, during, uh, uh, in, 19, in 2003, there was um, an experiment uh, there. And then you can see, well, uh, the, the actually era 20C kind of represents well uh, this um, increase in the, in the profile of winds related to the jet. Now, we look into this, we look into these two phases of the AMO, um, and look into negative. Now we're going to show those are differences in, in precipitation, in colors you see here, and differences in wind, in circulation. Now, the, the winds that are statistically significant are in blue. So you see that uh, during the, when you compare the negative with the positive AMO, you have a dry of, in the ITCZ, and, uh, and uh, wet conditions in the uh, subtropical um, uh, South America in this area, and also here in the Amazon. And so, um, so we, we, the, the explanation is that the outflow from the uh, suppressed convection enhances the easterlies, the cross equatorial uh, flow, and then enhancing the south jet and then precipitation. Now, this was done without removing uh, trans. And, uh, but if you remove trans in, in trans in circulation and trans in precipitation from the mean analysis, then uh, we get less of a signal over um, uh, uh, this area in South America, where most of the core of the monsoon is. That gives you also some clues that not everything is explained by AMO because if you remove the trend, the trend is, is actually related to something else, uh, uh, possibly uh, the warming or some, some other mechanism that is not explained, totally explained by the AMO. Yes, again, we have similar mechanisms. Notice that we have even stronger uh, drying conditions when you remove the trends, but less impact over this area in south uh, in, of the monsoon region. Um, okay. Now, I want to talk a little about the observed trends with instrumental data, which means uh, using historic during the historical period. But before I talk about this, I want to talk about one important issue that I, I, I usually explain to people that don't understand about climate change, what climate change is, what global warming is doing, global warming uh, uh, or climate change, when you talk about this, this is the climate on the steroids. What does it mean? Is that if you are, say you are playing, this is a, an interesting cartoon, that it means that 
you, you are a player, and if you take steroids, what happens is you are going to do the same things, but better. You're going to jump higher. You're going to run faster. And then this is, if you don't take the steroids, you're going to do the same things, but with much less energy. So what global warming does is also related to uh, 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 increasing moisture in the atmosphere. And, the, and that moisture is one of the steroids that has been driving uh, the, the engines of our planet, thermodynamics especially. So now, what about the warming in South America? This is based on NCAR and SEP and CAR reanalysis, uh, but we can see this in all other reanalysis even more uh, uh, remarkable. Here you see colors. I take uh, about uh, every five years, uh, and then I'm putting colors just so you can see the expansion of the I took one isotherm, the 18 Celsius, about the 85th percentile. And then you can see every five years this increasing over South America. This is between 27 and 2010, right? And if you look at others, say the 15 Celsius, it is 80, 50 millibars. This is November. You can see that it's also uh, uh, expanding over the uh, ocean. So that, that's a way, a simple way of understanding what is the warming that we observe in the tropics. And so we want to understand what is the implication of that. Because if you have an increase in temperature, you have an increase in moisture, uh, more higher, strong, uh, higher temperatures can hold more, more moisture right, in the air. So this is Clausius Clapeyron equation. And now we know that extreme precipitation is increasing in the planet Earth. And then um, in a warming climate, has been expected that mean precipitation will increase in wet regions and decrease in drying regions. They, they have called this the reach get richer uh, aspect because they say, okay, in conversion zones, you should expect, expect more precipitation away in, in regions where you have your, uh, your already dry, you should expect to be dry. That's the reach gets richer. Um, and so, but what explains these variations in, in precipitation? Two main factors. One is the thermodynamics, which is related to Klaus Klopperol. The other one is the dynamic, which is related to changes in vertical movement, right? Um, and then we want to see what is, we have been observing over the months. I want to call, I want to bring this to your attention because we have been looking at this a lot with, uh, with uh, data sets and this is, uh, crew is one of them that we have been using a lot. And I want to point out how terrible this data is when you try to look into long-term uh, variability because things change a lot in South America. If you look at North America, it's pretty much the same throughout all decades. But if you look at South America, you see the number of stations uh, that are, are, are present. This is showing number of stations, by the way, in 28 e uh, years. You see that it varies quite a lot. Very good in Argentina, which is very important because you're going to see that these good signals often appear in Argentina, signals of climate change. But it's, it's not surprising because this consistent data in this area is very inconsistent over the Amazon. If you look what the implication of this when you calculate the percentiles, then you start seeing, okay, large percentiles at this point, little less, very, very <laughs> decreasing the percentile, increasing the percentile, is this climate change. We have to be careful when we inter interpret this and how we interpret this uh, data set <coughs> as well. So, now, one of the first uh, papers that discussed this uh, climate change was Liebman et al., 2004. And he used, uh, uh, he used rain gauges uh, where they were available. They were high, uh, high number of rain gauges in, uh, in this area. And he showed that there was a, an increase in, in uh, uh, DJF, no, January to March rainfall over uh, uh, in southern Brazil. And this was not, everybody thought, oh, this is ENSO related. But he demonstrated, no, 
There's something else there. There's no answer relationship. So later, uh, this, this article, Seeger uh, 2010, also showed he used the GPCC, graded precipitation, and showed the signal in increasing precipitation in this area. Also showed here, but this is, to me, very suspicious, and then some decrease in precipitation in this region. And he tried to connect this to other, uh, uh, oh, sorry, sorry. Um, other uh, modes, and he showed some good correlation with the AMO. He already found a good correlation between uh, this observation and the AMO um, for this result. So evidence in other variables. What, what can we look with? Can we see? This is basically the linear trend in integrated moisture flux divergence from the onset to the demise of the monsoon. The onset and the demise of the monsoon were determined according to an index. Uh, you have to, to trust me, it's a pretty good index. <laughs> but I, I, um, I just wanna show, when you look at these trends, um, you see there is an increase in convergence in the, in the ITCZ, a decrease, a divergence in, a, in a, a, a Eastern Amazon, um, and also an increase in convergence along this line east of the Andes, southeastern Brazil, towards the uh, SACC. Now, um, this has been related to the possibly the drought severity that we have observed in recent years, published before. Uh, and this is also related to the increase in precipitation, uh, or maybe explained by the which gets richer. We don't know. This is, this is still uh, needs some, some some extra work. Now, are extremes becoming more extreme? That's another question, right? So we, we got the impression that the answer is yes, right? When you look at uh, the recent decades, how many extreme uh, uh, conditions we have observed recently. Uh, but the question is, can we show that? So one of very interesting uh, studies was done by Silva Diaz et al. And uh, she looked at the very long record of precipitation from a very reliable uh, station in, in, in southeastern Brazil. And, uh, and look at what she found. She, she found, she looked at from October to March, the total precipitation, and she found a pretty interesting trend in this event. What uh, they also did, they also calculated the uh, a moving average uh, of the 85th, 80 percentile, 90 percentile, 99 percentile. Now there's something even more interesting coming out of this. Okay, you see the overall trend, but look at this. When you look at percentiles representing extremes, you also see decadal variability. So that's the story that I, I like about thinking of the climate on steroids, because see, you get your decadal variability, they are there, no question, our AMOs, PDOs, ENSOs, but there is something else going on here. Right? So this is um, Marcia talk a little about her. Uh, this is part of Marcia Zilli's uh, 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 PhD. And what she did, she looked at extreme precipitation, also analyzing uh, 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 precipitation from rain gauges. And she, you can see the density of rain gauges, how this vary uh, uh, in Brazil. We have nothing here, a lot lot of rain gauges in some areas. Um, but nevertheless, she looked at several, several indices uh, that were related to extreme precipitation, just showing one here. This is trend in seasonal precipitation. Uh, and this is trends in the 95th percentile, millimeters per day per decade. We can see that uh, kind of interesting seesaw we see here, she was talking about this morning. Uh, some people asked about seeing trends in, in, in using data, using rain gauge, and, um, and also, but, but when you look at trends in 95th percentile, this looks not as uh, divided. We see maybe drier conditions uh, in this part, but very wet or, or very strong uh, trends in, in, uh, in the eastern part of the country. Oh, no. <laughs> oh. 
Okay. All right. So, in, no, no. Uh, so we discussed about the Paul Ward shift of the SACZ, uh, which is, I know why it's not connected, right? <laughs> if we don't connect the power, it's not going to work. Okay, so uh, this is uh, basically the, uh, showing the uh, DJF precipitation rate, just to remember, the SACZ. Um, and this is what she found when she compared, she calculated the differences between the last and the first periods uh, using G GPCP. So with the idea that we are comparing the mean state of the atmosphere into different uh, decades. Um, and uh, and uh, we were convinced that we observed a shift in the SACZ. Um, we also show uh, some differences. If you remember those uh, sea star regions we were talking about, so everything seems consistent with what we would expect in case that the SACZ was, was moving to the, towards the pole. Now, um, when you look at uh, uh, the differences in specific humidity, uh, you see that between the two decades, you see that, well, basically the entire tropic, tropics is observing more uh, specific humidity, it's becoming more humid. And this is expected by Clausius Clapeyron, the planet's warming to have more specific humidity, and this is this is global. Now, when you look at 700 millibars, uh, it's a little above, we start seeing some features that are important. And I want to point out these two uh, regions here, north and south of the SACC, where you actually uh, see a decrease of drying conditions and wet conditions. We also look at uh, this, what's happening with the differences in winds and circulation, and you actually see the an anticyclonic trend north of the SACZ and a cyclonic trend uh, uh, south of the SACZ. Now, we think that this, this uh, trend we observe here is actually related to the increase in subsidence. So the increase in subsidence may explain uh, why you get less uh, specific humidity at 700 millibars and not very close to the ocean level. Okay. So, uh, if you look also at differences in, in divergence, and again, it's just to show consistency between things. So, you see uh, convergence aloft, this is a field aloft, and uh, divergence aloft, consistent with all the shift in convection towards this subtropics. So, so far, everything seems to be going to the same direction that there is uh, precipitation is moving to uh, the uh, subtropics. Much uh, very likely because uh, the planet is uh, the tropics are expanding as well. So uh, here you see seasonal trends of IVT uh, during the sol jet, during the occurrence of the jet, and you can see this is September uh, to November, December to February, and you can see again this increase in the anticyclonic. Oops, sorry. Uh, and cyclonic circulation also during the occurrence of the jets. This is important. And also the increase in the, the, the jet itself, the wind speed of the IVT uh, during the occurrence of the jet, indicating an enhancement in the transport of moisture towards the uh, subtropics of you know, South America. This is what Marcia showed in the morning, so we think this is the observer change is actually uh, a shift of the SACZ and an enhancement of the westerly transport, low-level jet, transporting more towards the south, uh, uh, west, easterly of South America. Now, what, what are the impacts in the monsoon? Elstead demise and precipitation. We need first to define a monsoon. We heard in the, uh, on the first day how to define monsoons, but I like my index. I'm going to use, uh, talk about the larger scale uh, index for South American monsoon. 
This index was basically based on Zhao and Lao uh, ideas uh, that if you remove the total mean uh, of those of circulation and precipitation, you en emphasize the seasonal means, uh, which I just showed in the first slide discussing the monsoon. So I used this idea. What I used was just a few variables. Uh, precipitation, zonal, medial wind, specific humidity, temperature. Uh, and I, in this case, I'm going to show today is uh, from NSEP and CAR, the analysis. And I use also uh, combined EOF. I'm going to talk Friday a little bit about this methodology. Um, and, uh, and then we interpret the first two modes. The first two modes, the first modes explain the SAMs. The second modes, mode explain the X SACZ. So when you look at, this is just a, a loading or correlations with the variables. Um, and what it shows is that when the index is positive, you have enhanced precipitation in the core of the monsoon. You have enhanced uh, specific humidity over South America, westerlies, easterlies, northerlies, and air temperature increasing the subtropics. All together defines a monsoon system, right? So no surprise, we got this. The second mode is more uh, related to the SACZ. So you see precipitation enhanced over southeastern South America, decreased over southern South America. And then you see the sea soil specific humidity, zonal winds, meridional winds, air temperature, and so on. So everything is consistent because these variables explain the monsoon and the SACZ. We use this. Uh, we don't need that. OK. Uh, this is how the index, the indices look like. So this is the monsoon index. And this fast moving is the SACZ index, right? The first two components. Uh, we use the, the first index, the monsoon. Uh, we are using to characterize the onset and demise of the monsoon. We just look at the, uh, the temporal, the, the, um, the index as an index. And when it becomes positive, Consistently positive is the onset. When it becomes consistently negative is the demise. And the direction, duration is the uh, dates between the two. Um, we found uh, average in October of the onset, average of the demise in, in April. Um, as for the amplitude, we also look at the amplitude of the monsoon using this. And what we did, we just calculated the integral between the positive curve here and defined this. This was an, our definition as, a, as the monsoon amplitude. We also calculated correlations between uh, this amplitude and precipitation. You can't rely on this because this is very early, but correlations are pretty high when you remove the trend. They are 0.68. So when you talk about the amplitude of the monsoon, you are actually a way of looking at uh, the precipitation in the core of the monsoon. This is precipitation in the core where you see the loading very high in this, this South America. We look at what happened to the amplitude of the monsoon. Uh, along these years using NSEP and CARB analysis, and we find uh, basically kind of jump. We are talking about that gentleman was talking about the uh, Argentina today that I asked that question. He showed something very similar happening in Argentina, looking at precipitation there, and we see similar things, just a jump in the mean, uh, which we think is, is actually not the analysis driven, but, but this is caused by a shift in climate in the 70s. Uh, we see this in several other signals. Today, this morning, we saw in another one. Uh, we see similar thing uh, in, the, in the duration of the monsoon. Now, this is uh, also, again, this is showing that the monsoon is driven by more. It's not only global warming. There's a lot of uh, interdecadal and other uh, 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 variability that we need to incorporate in our understanding. When you do a rank correlation, uh, we did trend it. So we move trends from SST, we move trends from the monsoon index, and you calculate uh, the correlation between the, uh, the index uh, and SST, we start seeing emerging something very interesting. And I want to point out, especially 
uh, from 1977 to 2008, here is what uh, I think Barheris was talking about yesterday. So you see this influence of the North and South uh, Atlantic um, in, in influencing this pattern, emerging as explaining the variability of the monsoon. Um, um, this needs more study, of course, but now, to finish, what is the tendency we, we expect in 21st century? And now we're going to talk about semi-5 simulations. I won't spend a lot of time with this, uh, but um, we published this, uh, looking to the semi-5, uh, some models, not all of them. Um, and what we show is that projections for temperature, well, of course, I don't have to, to say that projections are just showing that it's going to continue warming. Uh, those are different models, how the different models are showing. This uh, dark line is showing uh, what is, was uh, in 2011, and everything else as it expands towards the red one is, is the end of the century. Uh, as you look at, uh, this is another way, this ensemble mean, just showing the increase in the percentiles of, uh, of the uh, temperature over South America. Uh, the area covered by these percentiles increasing, so warming indeed. And I will finish with this uh, showing differences in daily precipitation uh, between the end of the century, the climatology, the mean climatology, and the climatology uh, between 1951 and 1980. So you can see what the models are showing. They may not agree with each other, but one feature that seems to appear uh, more frequently among the models, and uh, if you add more models, even more, more uh, 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 robust, is this increase in, in uh, the subtropical um, uh, precipitation in the subtropics. So it seems that the trend we are observing according to the models should continue. But don't forget, models don't have this AMO correctly uh, in place. So, in conclusion, we see the evidence of the poleward shift of the SACC. Uh, we see a positive trends on moisture transports towards the subtropics during South Jet uh, events. We see increasing seasonal summer precipitation in the subtropics. Um, drier conditions over eastern tropical South America following this shift uh, forward. Uh, increasing extreme precipitation in most regions of South America and the planet, by the way. Uh, I want to point out the importance of decade of variability combined to anthropogenic forcing our climate on steroids. And, uh, and I want to mention that semi 5 trend uh, show trends in temperature and precipitation that seem to persist in the future. And thank you. <laughs> this is Leila, thank you for your talk. Excellent talk. You covered <laughs> so much. I was curious, and maybe it's uh, because I live in another environment. How do you define the SACZ? Do you have an index for the SACZ? Yes. Thanks for asking. Well, in this particular, uh, some of the things I showed before, I defined with the, with the second EOF, combined EOF index. But in, in the work that Marcia was uh, looking at, uh, I think, no, it was just the climatology based on the climatology, this previous, when we talk about this shift, when you look at this, it was basically on the climatology where we see the maximum variance of precipitation over the ocean and over the continent and where we see the more precipitation. That was... I was curious about the part of the ocean. And let me tell you briefly, okay. very fast. Ah. Ah. Okay, just closer, yes. So... Um, <laughs> Well, you talk about the southward shift, uh -huh. and I've been looking at the Atlantic subtropical gyre with a lot of indices and measure, and it's clear the southward shift, particularly after the 70s, 
Oh, it's interesting. So it, I thought it was very interesting if we can put these things together. And my question, my, ne my final question is, why don't you, wouldn't you consider that it's the ocean driving, you know, the changes in temperature? Because we do see this southern shift. We're bringing more, you know, warmer temperatures to the surface. More, the water masses are becoming less dense. You've got a lot of processes that could you know, could be influencing the... We have been discussing this. Uh, I think this was one of the, the major issues we have been talking about in this, in this uh, workshop, and I'm glad you brought this up, because this is one effort, major effort. We need to understand this. Ilana, I, I don't have an answer. We should get to, you know, efforts in actually increasing observation as well, because we are very, uh, you know, we need to have an experiment the same, <laughs> we had the name, not only the same, to, to understand better, collect more data, for sure. I agree with you. Leila, uh, how do you compute the amplification, the Zaka's amplification, the moon? The amplitude. The amplitude. The amplitude. I guess I went too fast, right? Uh, the amplitude was the integral between um, with below the curve. It's it's an arbitrary number, right? But you can calculate the integral uh, between the the oh sorry the uh, after the onset, after you establish when the onset happens, say let's let's take this figure. Uh, when you look at um, the onset, between onset and demise, you you can calculate the area below that curve, right? So that area, that integral, is the amplitude. It's simple as that. Hi. Uh, thank you so much for such wonderful presentation. I especially like uh, uh, the concept that you put there. So the um, this variability uh, is, you know, the climate changing is putting this variability on steroids. I think that's a really great way of understanding this variability as well as communicating to the uh, society. Uh, I uh, have a one uh, curious question. So uh, for the southern hemispheric, uh, uh, especially jet, which influenced the uh, SACZ as well, uh, the uh, ozone depletion is an uh, important uh, forcing. Um, but as uh, the as this uh, Kyoto Protocol become uh, the impact as their impact on ozone depletion become more visible, we would expect uh, this forcing uh, decreasing while the increase of greenhouse forcing increase. Mm -hmm. uh, in this uh, climate uh, projection, uh, some model probably include this, whereas others <coughs> do not. And how does this uh, effect uh, influence the projection for the South American monsoon you know, the storm track, the SACZ. Um, so your, your idea you, is that we should look more also in the extra tropics, not only teleconnections with, uh, with uh, other modes we talk about, AMOs, but also yeah. what's going yeah. on in the extra tropics, if yeah. they represent well yeah. Maybe this stratospheric. Absolutely. <laughs> Maybe in form of uh, SAM. Like, uh, this SAM is a sudden annular mode. Right. And not... South American monsoon. So that would be very uh, that, that would be an interesting thing to see. Also to see whether they uh, they contribute to these intermodal discrepancy, right? Because if you are including right. uh, these processes in the projection, uh, you you will have a weaker forcing, right? Because the ozone From recovery. The Otherwise, uh, you will have a stronger forcing uh, if you still assume ozone is the same as today's. That, that could be important for the, for the generation of wave trains uh, we were discussing yesterday uh, in her talk. Leila, nice talk. 
Uh, I would like to know which, um, how, uh, because you showed in the, at the beginning of your presentation some uh, indications of the tropical uh, extension expansion. Uh -huh. And then you showed in the last part of your presentation also uh, indications of the tropical expansion. So how can you sep uh, separate which are caused by the global warming that's uh, the projection in the last part of your presentation, and which are for natural uh, causes that you showed. Uh, I think that uh, these are related to natural causes well, in the uh, beginning. Well, I, of your I think the, the, uh, you are asking about attributions <laughs> and etc. The, the way is to look into uh, the PI control and you know the uh, simulations. If this is your question, how the models are separating this this uh, aspect. Uh, uh, I showed the observations from the analysis. You can see this. Of course, we all understand this is happening. Uh, but it's of course it's forced by other other low low modes of variability we have been talking about. The models may not represent well, and these modes can offset actually the observed uh, warming. Uh, if they change phases, right? So we have to consider this as well. So models are showing expansion, no end into this, but there be there might be some offset at some point as we have the high <laughs> echoes in the in the in the climate. Others will occur, right? Models are not capable of showing these high echoes. Hi. Uh, <clears throat> there are many indices that you, you said you prefer yours, it's <laughs> natural. <laughs> but uh, what do you think of this series of indices? What, what could we do about all these indices to get the onset, the demise? Because uh, we talk about this in the first day. <laughs> And I think this is one discussion that uh, we, ne we need to have at some point. And uh, Charles uh, said, well, we need to, to have some metrics to, to get this uh, kind of... Uh, I think we need to separate what's, what we want. Is it to detect the wet season or the monsoon? The monsoon is, all, to my view, is all this global variability over South America. If you want to be concerned about the wet season. You want to know if the wet season is becoming uh, earlier or late in some parts. Then we have to go back to these indices that look at precipitation or circulation or put boxes. That makes sense to me. But here, I, 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 this index, index was more to understand the climate variability over South America. That was the goal. <laughs> it's not a better than any other. I'm just joking. We love our indices. Eh? Okay, okay, thank, thank you, you. Thank Leila. You. Now, Pedro. <laughs> Pedro will talk about paleoclimatic uh, aspects of the South American monsoon. Okay. 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 Um, well, my talk is um, on the paleo monsoon. Uh, but first of all, let me tell you a little story about why I got interested in this topic. Many, many years ago, actually it was in the early 80, 80s, uh, we were initiating the field activities in the Amazon. And uh, a researcher at the National Institute of Amazon Research told me at that time about the black lands in the Amazon. 
the black lands in the Amazon, the picture on the left, were an indication of agricultural practices in the Amazon about 11,000 years ago. Actually, this story about um, the human migration to South America around 11K has been highly disputed nowadays because there are several indications that uh, there were Homo sapiens in South America well before this time. Whether they came from uh, uh, New Zealand, Australia, or they came from Africa, that's uncertain. And uh, that indicates uh, pretty evolved agricultural practices, um, geometrical shapes, and so on. And it turns out that the archaeological studies suggest that these uh, uh, people, they basically vanished at some time, moved to someplace else. One of the possibility is that they moved to uh, uh, Serra da Capivara, this uh, place in the state of Piauí, northeast Brazil, as you can see up there. Let's see, I think I have a pointer here. Um, and uh, it's an, an amazing site. Maybe some of you know this area. It's fantastic. If you haven't been there, I recommend visiting this area. It's something really unique. That's the place where there are indications of people living there before uh, 11K. And these guys, they were there for a long time. There's a very interesting book by Luana Campos. Um, and there is a rupture of the civilization, the Serra da Capivara, between 9K and 6K before present. It was a very dry period, around 6K, 4K. And they basically vanished from this area around 4K. Um, so, I was told these stories back in the 80s, and uh, you know, you know, we were there in the Amazon, the wet forest, and you think, well, if these guys, they, if they moved, <laughs> it means that the forest uh, also probably moved, right? Hard to understand why you would move from a place like the Amazon with lots of rain, doing pretty sophisticated agricultural, agricultural practices, uh, just like that, you know? Uh, that actually is the thing that uh, got me first interested in uh, um, looking at paleoclimatic uh, information in order to understand long-term changes in the precipitation regime here in, in, in Brazil. And of course, <clears throat> this is related to the South American monsoon. Uh, that I ha don't have to say anything because you had plenty of uh, presentations on the monsoon. So, but this is a, is a lecture on the paleoclimate aspects and I decided to go through some basics, radiation balance concepts in order to, you know, um, explore the, the potential role of uh, <coughs> changes in the energy balance in controlling climate in a long time uh, series, uh, basically through uh, the impact of changes in the differences in between the northern hemisphere energy balance, the southern hemisphere energy balance, and the ITCZ position. So that's the idea. <clears throat> well, I think you all know that the Earth receives energy from the sun in short wave and loses energy in space in long waves. And this is the basic reasoning behind the, the greenhouse effect. And the important point is the fact that when you go through the global, here it's the global. Later on, I'll talk about the hemispheric energy balance. But when you're talking about the global energy balance, the important point is the fact that uh, 
you have, um, from the point of view of the surface, you have a surplus of energy of the order of 98 watts per square meter. And from the point of view of the atmosphere, you have a loss of 98 watts per square meter, in other words. And therefore, you have to somehow transfer energy from the surface to the atmosphere through sensible heat and latent heat, right? So everybody knows that. Um, if you go <clears throat> through the energy balance of uh, atmospheric column, there are some very nice one-dimensional models that provide you with uh, the means to <clears throat> understand the role of the Earth's albedo, the emissivity, um, and how changes in emissivity and albedo would change the temperature of the atmosphere. And emissivity is primarily due to the effect of CO2 and H2O, and albedo is very much related to ground cover, ice, water, vegetation, and so on. And uh, when you do that uh, in realistic atmosphere with uh, the moisture, uh, realistic moisture profile, just that one dimensional problem gives you a reasonable looking vertical temperature profile of the temperature, the radiative balance, primarily if you include some kind of mixing near the, <coughs> in the troposphere to adjust the lapse rate. And actually the tropopause from these studies, you learn that the tropopause exists because of shortwave heating in the stratosphere due to ozone, right? So if you remove ozone, you don't get the tropopause. In other words, the temperature up here would be much colder. And uh, this is important because it separates the atmosphere in two main structures, the troposphere and the stratosphere. <coughs> CO2 concentration is rather uniform, but uh, water, of course, is much more important uh, near the surface. The other important point is that more solar radiation is received in the equatorial region than at high latitudes. Long wave loss, on the other hand, is pretty much uniform between the equator and the pole. Therefore, you actually have <clears throat> more net energy in the equatorial region, and you have a loss, negative uh, balance of energy at the polar regions. Um, and uh, if that's the case, the tropics have, have supposed to loan, you know, money, I mean heat, to the uh, uh, polar area in order to balance the, the, uh, the, the, en the energy balance of the whole Earth. And if you look at the uh, latitudinal distribution of, uh, of uh, solar energy, the first thing that strikes you when you look at this is that the northern and the southern hemisphere is not symmetric right? And I, I suppose you know why. It's because the orbit of the Earth is an elliptic and, uh, and we are closer to the sun um, in the southern hemisphere summer, right? And that's the reason why you have this asymmetry. But this asymmetry uh, changes in time. As you probably know, it's related to the Milankovitch cycle. Um, the global energy, if you integrate over the whole globe, the Milankovitch cycles don't change the total amount of energy reaching the Earth, but it changes the latitudinal distribution. And that's very important if you're talking about long-term <coughs> climatic changes, because if one hemisphere gets more energy than the other, again, you have to loan money, I mean energy, to the poor hemisphere, right? And that re requires some kind of transport. And the transport is provided either by the ocean 
or the atmosphere, or both. And you see what happens in, in reality in a few more slides. Uh, <clears throat> so you can have a radiative model that is dependent on latitude. And therefore, you can study the impact of the fact that you have the surplus of energy in the tropics and the deficit here. This requires the heat transfer. And that's the, <coughs> the outcome. When you look at the uh, reanalysis data, for instance, you end up uh, with this, uh, the blue curve is the atmospheric transport, the red curve is the ocean transport, and the total transport is the black curve. And the shading here is the uncertainty in these estimates based on different uh, reanalysis. And if you zoom near the equator, you'll see that uh, uh, the heat transport is not zero at the equator. So it's asymmetric. The reason for being asymmetric is the fact, first of all, the fact that you have uh, more solar energy reaching during the summer here in the southern hemisphere, less in the northern hemisphere, and the fact that the northern hemisphere, you have much more land than in the southern hemisphere. And this uh, makes the... Um, energy balance not symmetrical between the northern hemisphere and southern hemisphere. And that's a clue for why the ITCZ is not sitting right at the equator. Uh, hmm. Oh. Okay, and that's a more detailed uh, picture and a reference of where this uh, slide comes from. So it's very important. You see, it's a small number. And actually, I went back to some estimates of this uh, energy flux at the equator back in the 50s, not much data. How it evolved, if you look at publications from the sellers, from the old sellers book to newer books, uh, you see that these figures vary a lot. There were times in the past when this zero was right at the equator. It was kind of forced to be at the equator uh, because the data was not that good, right? But nowadays, that's the latest uh, estimates. <laughs> and as a result of the fact that you have this uh, northward transport, uh, uh, in the atmosphere, we know that the ITCZ is to the north of the equator. And therefore, the ITCZ through the Hadley circulation, it's actually bringing heat from the northern <coughs> hemisphere to the southern hemisphere. Isn't that strange? Because when you go over the radiative energy balance, energy has to go from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. But if you look at the atmospheric data reanalysis, if the ITCZ is sitting to the north of the equator, the Hadley circulation is transferring heat to the southern hemisphere. There's no other way with this kind of circulation. Okay. And that's a fact. I mean, if you look at the mean ITCZ position, it's uh, uh, sitting in the northern hemisphere. And, of course, it changes summer and uh, winter. Uh, as you can see here, a lot of change, um, lots of variability, mostly in the Indian Ocean, but you also see it in the Atlantic and the Pacific Ocean. So what happens to the uh, ocean uh, circulation? Well, the ocean circulation, you have this thermohaline circulation, uh, warm waters going to the north here, cold to the south, and that's there's a connection with the Indian Ocean, with the Pacific Ocean. So the heat transport in the ocean is performed by the thermohaline circulation. Um, what is the thermohaline circulation? Well, it's uh, basically, uh, uh, it's, a, it, it's, it's actually measured nowadays. You can actually measure the amount of uh, heat. Uh, and it's the not, uh, 
when you look at the, uh, the transport uh, separated into the Pacific, Atlantic, and Indian Ocean, it's very interesting. Look at this. This is just the oceanic heat transport. That's the total transport. The Pacific is the green line. So the Pacific uh, also is not zero at the equator. Uh, it's negative. Um, the Atlantic, on the other hand, look at the Atlantic. The Atlantic, the heat transport is always to the north from the southern, near the, uh, the southern uh, areas of the <laughs> hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. It's always positive. In other words, to the north. The other oceans, in an average sense, transport heat to the south. But the um, Atlantic Ocean is always transporting heat to the north. That's ECMWF, and this is NCEP. Uh, there are changes, but not doesn't change the, the structure. Um, Now, what drives the thermal haline circulation? The first mechanism is the cooling at high latitudes that changes the water density, and you have the high density water sinking to the bottom, and that drives the, that's the pump that uh, maintains the circulation. There's a second mechanism associated to the wind stress that also helps uh, maintaining the thermal haline circulation. And uh, actually, if you go through some model results uh, in this paper, for instance, uh, if you uh, change the, under a high intensity thermal haline circulation or a low in, uh, circulation, uh, thermal haline circulation, there is a significant change in the ITCZ position. In other words, with, uh, um, high uh, intensity thermal haline circulation, the ITCZ moves to the north. And there is a significant change in the position of the ITCZ depending on the intensity of the thermal haline circulation from models. That's the conclusion. Southward migration of ITCZ under low uh, AMOC, the Atlantic Meridiano overturning circulation. This is very important. So keep this idea in mind. Now, there are indices that uh, are somehow related to AMOC. It's not exactly AMOC, but it's somehow related. AMO, Leila, uh, where is Leila? Leila talked about uh, AMO, uh, the 60-year cycle and so on. And uh, it's very, pretty clear that there is a, a significant uh, process going on in the Atlantic Ocean concerning the variability of the um, meridiano overturning circulation. <clears throat> there are reconstructions of the AMO index in the historical um, over a thousand years. It's mostly based on residues of uh, actually rocks that uh, were uh, transported from Greenland and other areas in the Northern Hemisphere to the ocean through the icebergs. So the rocks are there in the iceberg, and when the iceberg melts, the rock falls to the bottom of the ocean. Then you go there, you ask the rock, how old are you? And they answer, right? And uh, you know uh, when the, the iceberg uh, uh, drifted to that uh, latitude. So rocks talk, right? Um, that's what I learned from my friends, uh, the geologists. Right, Ilana, our good friends, uh, geologists, they talk to rocks. Uh, and you can actually do, in this case, <coughs> it's a Hubert uh, transform of the, this time series. And you have it in different uh, time scales, fast time scales, slow time scales, and the tendency. So besides the 60-year cycle, uh, you have cycles. 180 years, for instance, is one of them. And uh, there is a much longer time scale, thousands of years, that apparently is here. And actually, it has been also observed in longer time series, trying to reproduce 
the AMO. Uh, so back to the heat transport in the ocean. Uh, let's go back now to this uh, figure and try to understand in more detail what's going on here at the equator. Because we know that there is some relationship with the ITCZ position, right? The model results that I just presented. Uh, <coughs> and the question that you have to ask, what are the consequences of the non-zero heat transport of the equator? And what controls the sign of the heat transport at the equator? An interesting paper about this uh, topic is by uh, Schneider and colleagues, the migration dynamics of the intertropical convergence zone. Um, this was perhaps one of the first papers in the recent times that discusses this issue about the positioning of the ITCZ from an energy balance point of view. Another important paper is by Marshall, 2014, the ocean's role in setting the mean position in the intertropical convergence zone. I think this is a paper that everybody who is interested in monsoon studies should uh, know by heart, know everything that is in there. I think it helps a lot understanding the dynamics of uh, the ITCZ position and the relationship between uh, oceanic transport and atmospheric transport. So the paper goes on with this uh, nice figure about the ITCZ mean position. And that's the question, what controls the position? Previous work, um, for instance, the work by Zhang and Delworth noted that the shift of TCZ on the equator following the collapse of the ocean uh, uh, meridian overturning circulation. In other words, this was observed in model results uh, well before. Uh, broccoli, uh, carry out perturbation slab experiments with cooling in the northern hemisphere, warming of the southern hemisphere, implicitly impo imposing a southward oceanic heat transport, uh, and observe enhanced northward atmospheric heat transport across the equator. In other words, in models, you, with coupled models, you, 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 you have an indication that the ITCZ position is responding to changes in the uh, oceanic uh, overturning circulation. Foucault also dialyzed and sector coupled general circulation model, also observed similar things. Frierson make the connection between the hemispheric energy flow and the ITCZ more explicit. In other words, there are a series of papers um, indicating that we have to look at the energy balance because previously, most people used to uh, explain the fact that the ITCZ sits in the northern position due to the fact that you have more continents. And it's not wrong, but it's not the true reason. The true reason is related to the fact that you have to close the energy balance. And uh, you have uh, transport uh, done, uh, executed by the atmosphere and by the ocean. And they have to get along and talk to each other and uh, solve, decide uh, who's going to transport heat from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere because of the orbital characteristics of the uh, Earth uh, at this moment. I think uh, Marcelo showed something like this yesterday, right? I wasn't here, but uh, I had a, a spy here, right? <laughs> uh, and the, the point is, uh, when you look at the asymmetry of radiation, in the southern hemisphere and northern hemisphere, green is the outgoing long wave radiation, red is the net short wave, and uh, purple is the net radiation at the top of the atmosphere. And that's what's important, the net radiation at the top of the atmosphere. So look at this. Uh, there is more solar energy reaching the southern hemisphere than the northern hemisphere. But there is more long wave radiation leaving the atmosphere in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere. As a result, when you integrate this over the whole hemisphere, you get an excess of 0.2 petawatts, a lot of watts, uh, in the southern hemisphere, and a deficit of 0.2. Right? 
So you have to transport energy from the southern hemisphere to the northern hemisphere. And there are two guys who do, who do this job, the atmosphere and the ocean. Uh, so that's the required transport at the equator. Uh, Now, you go to the data and ask uh, how much heat you're transporting to the north in the ocean, how much heat you're transporting in the atmosphere. And it turns out you need 0.2. But the ocean is very excited and transports 0.4 petawatts. That's a problem, right? <coughs> transporting more energy than necessary. And then the ocean, who is kind of sluggish, tells the atmosphere, it's up to you, solve the problem. So the atmosphere, there's nothing else that the atmosphere can do except transport 0.2 uh, petawatts to the south. That's the only way to close the balance. And that's why the ITCZ is to the north. If you didn't have the ocean, actually the ITCC should stay to the south of the equator, right? Because uh, you have to transport 0.2 to the north. If the ocean couldn't transport heat, the ITCC should sit to the south. And then if you look at the paleoclimatic uh, studies, there are strong indications that there were periods in the past when the ITCZ was well to the south of where it is now. If that's true, it means that the ocean transport should be very small. That's the only way to have the ITCZ to the south. And our relatives, you know, those guys who lived in the Amazon 11 years ago or in the Serra da Capivara, um, they probably went through this period, right? because there were lots of rain in Piauí. Piauí was wet, really wet. And there are several other indications that uh, uh, northeast Brazil was very wet in some periods in the past. So that's the story. In other words, you need now, the atmosphere needs to transport 0.2 terawatts uh, to the south, and that means that the um, Hadley cell sits to the north. Uh, well, yes, the, we'll see later these things. Uh, for those who are interested, there are several references in some of these uh, slides. Marshall paper refers to the present climate. How about past climate? Okay, now we have to go back to the Milankovitch cycles. You have the changes in the uh, orbital parameters, uh, the tilt, of the Earth's axis, changes in the location of the sun compared to the Earth in the elliptic uh, trajectory. Um, and uh, if you look at uh, long-term changes, you'll see uh, significant evidence of uh, um, not just the orbital parameters, which are longer in time, but if you look at the, some uh, reconstructions of uh, solar activity, you find periods much shorter, 11 years, uh, 60 years, 80 years, 180 uh, to 200 years, uh, and over uh, 200 and something, and over 1,000 years. These are due to solar dynamics, solar internal dynamics, something that is not well known, but uh, we already we have some idea nowadays on how, how it works, and it's very important. In other words, uh, this solar output. Uh, some people say, well, but you see these solar cycles, like the 11-year cycle, from the uh, if you integrate over all wavelength, it's an absolute, <coughs> almost nothing. But uh, if you look at the ultraviolet band, then it is significant. It's of the order of uh, 8 to 18 percent of the energy in the ultraviolet sector. And the ultraviolet is the one that interacts with the ozone. 
and the ozone affects the energy balance of the stratosphere and therefore affects the, the temperature and the wind due to, just, to the uh, geostrophic balance. Um, if you look at the Milankovitch cycles on a much longer time scale, this is uh, K years, in other words, one million years, you see lots of important cycles that are pretty well known. This is a nice uh, paper about the Milankovitch cycle. And again, if you look at the shorter record reconstruction of the solar activity, there was a minimum uh, period of activity in the sun uh, around uh, the year 600, 650 and so on. Uh, we went through a maximum and now we're going back to a minimum uh, part of this long-term cycle. And uh, over this uh, curve, you, you have the much shorter time scales, the 11 year and the 80 year, 60, 80 year cycles. Another way to change the energy balance in the atmosphere is to change the Earth's albedo, as I mentioned in one of the first slides. You can change the Earth's albedo through changes in the aerosol concentration. A very effective way to change the aerosol concentration in the atmosphere is volcanic activity, something that Ilana is uh, glued <laughs> in the few, last few years. Uh, and one of the papers that called my attention was this one uh, by the group from uh, Miriam Kudri in uh, IPSL, where they showed that uh, major volcanic eruptions. Um, I was taught when I was in graduate school uh, a few hundred years ago that uh, um, volcanic forcing was something that affected the atmosphere for a few years after the eruption. Two, three, four, five years at the most. However, these people and recent, more recent work, they have indicated, including a, a recent paper by I Ilana, and uh, that the effect is not restricted to the radiative, immediate radiative forcing. Actually, when you have the volcanic activity, that changes the thermal haline circulation because of melting polar regions and so on. And the impact <clears throat> in the thermal haline circulation is not restricted to this three, four years. It's much longer. So big volcanic activity, like the Tambora, for instance, or the Pinatubo, even the Pinatubo uh, eruption, uh, the impact lasts for decades because of the uh, impact in the ocean. In other words, changes in the thermal haline circulation and therefore changes in the positioning of the ITCZ. That's the paper that Ilana uh, published recently. Uh, if you look at the sun, um, you have... Uh, Volcanic activity is not periodic. I mean, uh, my colleagues at the geophysics department, that's something that I always ask them, is there any periodicity in volcanic explosion, uh, explosions? And they always say no. They don't find anything regular in the, uh, in, the, in the volcanic explosions. But the sun, yes. These are the cycles and the names of each of these cycles, even 2,300 years cycles, so on. So, uh, how can we measure what happens to the Earth's climate? There are paleoclimate reconstruction of South American monsoon, mostly based on speleothems in caves due to uh, the dripping of uh, water. Um, corals, corals not that long because there aren't many corals along uh, the Brazilian coast. There are some fos uh, fossil corals corals that uh, tell you something about the past beyond the 500 years, 400 years. Ice cores, for instance, in the Andes, lake sediments, tree rings, marine sediments. There are several marine sediments uh, papers on, uh, for instance, the Plata Basin, um, the um, 
in Northeast Brazil, in the Amazon. So there are several uh, indications nowadays that help us in reconstructing the overall aspects of the uh, monsoon in South America. And as I mentioned before, uh, the fresh water inflow uh, is measured by the, the rocks that uh, are thrown by the icebergs. With these things, you can actually measure uh, reconstructions. Look, this is 60,000 years. Um, and uh, ITCZ to the south is here. This is the uh, Cariaco Basin in Venezuela. So you see substantial changes in the uh, position of the ITCZ in these uh, long time scales. If you go to shorter time scales, this is a paper by Francisco Cruz, our colleague from the Geoscience uh, Institute at the University of Sao Paulo. Uh, and if you stick to this area here, that's that figure. It's wet below, dry above. So uh, you come from a very dry period during the last uh, interglacial. Then you get into a very wet period. And then you, you have this uh, uh, rapid change uh, here. And that's probably what uh, uh, drove our friends from uh, Serra da Capivara away from Serra da Capivara, because the conditions became pretty difficult there. Um, there are other places like in Bahia, in southern Brazil, and you find significant uh, connectivity between these areas with patterns that are not that much different from things that we know from nowadays in terms of uh, uh, seesaw patterns, right? Between uh, Northeast Brazil, Southeast Brazil, and Southern Brazil. A uh, paper by Novelo, more recent, amazing paper uh, with the reconstruction of several uh, speleothems in different areas, also indicating uh, a consistent patterns um, uh, indicating in, uh, not just changes in the South American monsoon as a whole, but mostly um, changes along the area where the South Atlantic Convergence Zone is more active. And I'll make a summary of this uh, in a few more slides. Okay. Then we, of course, we use the LISAM index that Leila uh, uh, studied, developed. And one of the students uh, uh, advised by Tercio Ambrisi uh, produced this very nice work, um, a reconstruction of Lisam and the uh, and, uh, and, uh, South Atlantic versions on mode using speleothems. These are the speleothems. So he used the OF analysis applied to these things. And then you can uh, reconstruct uh, the time series, and I'll go straight. He used um, EOFs perturbed uh, with a stochastic perturbation in order to estimate the impact of the uncertainties in the data. And this is a nice plot. Um, you have, uh, in the x-axis, you have the Lisa index. In the y, uh, you have the South Atlantic Conversion Zone Index. And you see that uh, in some periods, uh, the MCA, the meridional warm period, there are two phases. The transition to the cold period, the cold period is a little ice age, 1600s or so. Uh, and you see significant changes in the structure of the South Atlantic conversion zone mode um, during these, these periods. And this is just data. There's no model here. And what is, I find very curious, is the fact that uh, models, in general, tend to underestimate the, the intensity of uh, these changes. Models uh, don't quite reproduce this uh, so well, except if you use the TRACE21 experiments. I recommend, for those who don't know the TRACE uh, experiments, have a look at this page. It will be useful. Trace 21 is very interesting because the model is forced by the fresh water inflow at higher latitudes. So you're just pumping water, fresh water, in the ocean at higher uh, the pole, uh, North Pole and the South Pole, based on these reconstructions. And then 
you have, uh, for instance, um, the, the ITCZ modes uh, doing something similar to what Leila showed with the uh, EOFs using wind and temperature. You can reconstruct the time series, the last 21K, uh, and you see significant changes in the, uh, these are the EOFs, and that's the time series of the EOFs. Uh, and you see uh, major changes in the position of the ITCZ um, if associated to the, the melting of ice uh, uh, during these periods. Uh, and that's the freshwater inflow that was used. In the northern hemisphere, the red curve, and blue in the southern hemisphere. Um, June, July, August, same thing. Uh, and that's the mean position of the ITCZ. You see that uh, in the last 6,000 years, there has been a slow trend of the ITCZ moving towards the northern hemisphere. So a very, very interesting uh, case. And uh, this kind of agrees with observations because it was, the ocean was forced by the fresh water inflow. If you take a, one of these models, the CMIP models, and let it run free, uh, it's very hard to, to, to uh, reproduce these things. So, um, the last millennium, for instance, the South Atlantic Conversion Zone systematically migrates southward from the MCA, uh, year 1200 or so, um, towards the uh, Little Ice Age and towards the present. However, the most intense or enhanced South Atlantic Conversion Zone occurred during the Little Ice Age and a weaker South Atlantic conversion occurring during the second phase of the um, uh, 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 warm period in the medieval era. In, um, ITCZ in the CMIP models is not very good. I think you've seen a picture similar to this one in the first day. Uh, that's observation where the ITCZ is. Uh, the NCAR model gives IPSL what I would like to call you the attention is the fact that several models have a double ITCZ. That's an indication that the oceanic heat transport in these models is pretty much close to zero at the equator. In other words, they have, don't have the northward transport. If you have zero transport in the equator, there are, there's a very interesting paper showing that there are two possible stable solutions. One with the ITCZ right at the equator and another solution with a splitted ITCZ, a double ITCZ, one to the north and another to the south. So I, the fact is that these models with double ITCZ in general have zero uh, heat flux in the ocean, which is not good, right? MRI um, puts the ITCZ right over northeast Brazil. So it's raining a lot there, right? Um, this has the trace 21. Trace 21 is not perfect, but it's a very coarse resolution. It's a T21 model. Uh, you can compute Lisan uh, from, uh, from uh, in the PMIP uh, models. Uh, that's the structure uh, present, the 6K, 21K. It doesn't vary much. means that the Lisan and the South Atlantic Convergence Zones are very robust, right? That's good. Uh, and then you can compare changes in the, for instance, the Lisa mode, the first EOF, uh, uh, lower frequency, median 8 to 12, 2 to 7 years, and you see that uh, there are significant changes uh, depending on the period from the last glacial to the mid Holocene and to the present, right? And the models are somewhat consistent, not totally consistent. Uh, the problem with the CMIP and PMIP, PMIP is the same as CMIP, but just integrated in the past, is the fact that models have a southward bias of the ITCZ in the current climate and, more, and, and it's more intense. In other words, the heat transport is not as strong as observed. And there are several papers that show the same problem. So the ITCZ is always shifted. 
the Atlantic ITCZ bias in CMIP models. There's another interesting paper. Um, part of the problem is the fact that the east-west orientation of the ITCZ is not quite correct to, it's tilted in the models, indicating that the northward heat transport in the ocean across the equator, the, the bias is not the same in the east part and the west part of the Atlantic. South American monsoon variability over the last millennium, paper by Maiza Hojas. There are several other papers, including um, this is a, that's a paper by uh, this guy, Horig, present and future in the West African monsoon. There's a connection between the South American monsoon and the African monsoon due to the ITCZ position. And they all agree. Now, when you talk about future uh, and you look at the AMOC intensity in the IPCC models, uh, look at the difference between the strength of the AMOC in these models. That's really worrying, right? You have models like the green one here that has practically zero flow, a flux at the equator, and models that have a very intense flux. And just to finish, I concentrated the discussion on the uh, Atlantic ITCZ. But there are important issues concerning the South American monsoon due to the connection between the South American monsoon and uh, things that are happening in the Pacific Ocean, including the Pacific ITCZ and the Pacific SPCZ. Uh, this is based on the original work by Alice. Um, January, and you see the what uh, she calls the influence function. In other words, the connectivity it measures the connectivity between uh, things here and things uh, over here, indicating the SPCZ is a very important piece in this connection between the Pacific Ocean and the Atlantic Ocean. And the SPCZ is rooted in the convection in the uh, equatorial uh, Pacific. <laughs> Therefore, any changes in the positioning of the ITCZ in the Pacific is going to have an impact in the positioning of the SPCZ and therefore on the uh, overall characteristics of the South American monsoon system. Less explored than this, uh, what I explained before about the Atlantic. This is something that I think we should observe more carefully in the models. And just the last slide. So that's... Uh, uh, summary of what I talked about. Since I think I'm over time already, I'll stop here. about trace, uh, Matthias told me from Matthias from Albany told me that we shouldn't use the, the trace for the last millennium because it doesn't doesn't take into <laughs> account the volcanic eruptions. Yes. Yeah. What do you think? Yeah, but it contains the basic information about the, uh, for instance, the orbital forcing. Yeah. Um, it's a fact that the as you saw in those pictures. The trace variability before 8K is much higher than the trace variability after 8K. Uh, however, I think this is interesting in the sense that uh, you have an idea of what is due to the orbital <laughs> factor and uh, some ideas about the uh, internal variability of the system. Trace, for instance, has more power. If you do a periodogram, uh, in this period af uh, between 8K and, and present, than most of the CMIP models, in spite of the fact that it's a lower resolution model. Pedro, uh, the North Atlantic Rock talked with you, but what about somebody in the Pacific? What about the PDO? 
Ah, so that's the point. I mean, okay. uh, the, my last slide actually is uh, provides you with the hint that you have to look at uh, changes in the PDO right. uh, from the point of view of the uh, long-term changes. Actually, Lucas, uh, uh, postdoc, the postdoc that just got a job on Monday, <laughs> and I'm worried about what's going to happen <laughs> to this work, but I think we'll finish it. Uh, Lucas is looking exactly at this uh, connections between PDO, uh, AMO, uh, ENSO, and so on, from a strictly uh, data analysis point of view. And uh, some pre preliminary things that he showed me um, um, indicate this association between PDO and AMO. In other words, connections between the Atlantic overturning circulation and uh, impacts in the Pacific. And, and in the Pacific, you change the PDO, you change the uh, where the convection is located in the equator, uh, the latitude as well, and the SPCZ. And the SPCZ, the connection with us here in South America, is through the uh, PSA pattern. So Northern Hemisphere, PNA, Southern Hemisphere, PSA. Marcelo. Uh, thanks, Pedro. Very nice. Uh, I was wondering, regarding this experiment that traced 21K, right? Uh, one of the problems that this kind of experiment has is that the, the oceans that they use are very diffusive, are very low resolution oceans. Yes, very right? very low resolution. So but T21. Exactly. So the partition between the shallow circulation and the thermogenic circulation in terms of how yeah. much of the heat transport yeah. they they, they do, right? Yeah. It's very different from the real world. Yeah. So the problem then is that uh, we have done, we have some publications that if you, if you take, you do a housing experiment and with a very high resolution ocean or a you know, low resolution ocean, even though in both cases you see the uh, north-south gradient in temperature, the changes in the tropical region are very different. Yeah. Because that's where the shallow circulation, you know, yeah. essentially dominates. Yeah. So, so then the ITCC <coughs> will respond differently in both cases. Yeah. In so spite do you have of any that, comments on yeah. that? Yeah. In spite of that, even in the last uh, uh, <coughs> the end of the uh, Trace 21K experiments, the mean position of the ITCC is not too bad compared to other models. And I think there's a series of papers. One of them, I think, more recent is from uh, Cristiano Chiesi. Uh, he uh, pointed out that the, uh, the similarity between the Trace 21 reconstruction, the whole, in the younger Dryas, 11K to 8K in Northeast <laughs> Brazil, is remarkable. In other words, Trace 21 detects the fact that the ITCZ was to the south during this period, which is kind of surprising, considering what you mentioned about the low resolution. And Ilana, I think she wants to compliment, compliment my answer. Trace 21 is the spot model. I mean, we've been looking at that. Also, maybe, you know, for the fine-tuning, yeah. And what is the conclusion? We can talk about that later. Yeah. So, what is the conclusion from this thing? Uh, what she said is the fact that the impact of the fresh water inflow is fundamental. And the PMIP or CMIP models, they are not doing a great job with the thermal haline circulation. Yeah. And, and see if we don't. Even with the millennial run, yes. you know, we have a little more Maybe you don't know that uh, uh, PMIP is producing now a transient runs for the last uh, 6K. 
some go to 8K onwards and some from the 6K, 6K to the present. But uh, as Ilana mentioned, there are some problems there. So uh, you, you told a little bit about uh, the influence of volcanic uh, eruption on the thermohaline circulation. Uh, can you explain a little bit more on how does it influence, or maybe Ilana? Ilana, uh, I, she is the vo volcanic yes, person here. Yes, um, on this particular case, it's really interesting. So we looked at the, tried to look at the impact of volcan of eruptions on the South Atlantic and the, more specifically the Weddell Sea and the Antarctic Peninsula. And so uh, so we looked at uh, 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 a model run, ensemble run, the last millennial run, with several uh, very intense eruptions. But we also looked at Pinatubo, which is uh, mm -hmm. great because we have a lot of uh, data uh, observations that mm -hmm. we can, can look at. And basically what happens is it's an indirect <coughs> impact because by changing the, you know, the radiation balance and cooling the surface, you actually change the temperature gradient in the ocean and you change the winds, and that changed the, the circulation where I was looking at in the Weddell Sea. And actually what we got was a warming blob off the peninsula, which could mean that you know the trigger to collapse of ice shelves could be much uh, closer to us than we think. Yeah. So anyway. So but we also see in the subsurface, we also see propagation yeah. of these <coughs> signals from the equator into the extra tropics. So it's a pretty amazing. Something else that I'd like to stress is the fact that the CMIP or PMIP models, they seem also to underestimate a lot the effect of the solar cycles. Uh, and I think we know the reason. The reason is basically the lack of uh, vertical resolution in the semi models in the stratosphere. You don't have the mechanism to connect the stratosphere to the troposphere. We just submitted a paper on the QBO and MGO connectivity. QBO is up there. MGO is down here. Uh, and uh, it's quite clear in the data and not quite clear in the CMIP simulations. Uh, that's something else that uh, <coughs> makes me very much concerned about some of the uh, interpretations that we have on, uh, on the CMIP uh, simulations. So it's lacking as an important factor, which is the connection between the solar activity and the climate uh, where we live down here. Okay, now you are invited uh, with Leila and other uh, speakers uh, that pres uh, who presented today uh, talks to here at the. Tem, tem, tem mesa suficiente? Tem cadeira suficiente? Oh, que... Não, pode sentar também, pessoal, ali do outro lado. We'll make a summary and uh, identify... Fica com você. Uh -huh. Identify suggestions and uh, future uh, research needs. Yeah. Yeah. To, uh, well, today we saw uh, multi-decadal variability, 
um, uh, interannual, <laughs> but mainly was uh, multidecadal, interannual, and uh, also paleo and the future under climate change. So all these uh, time scales, we will now um, have some uh, messages uh, and uh, also the, what we want to know in the future, what are the developments we need to do still, and then uh, uh, what are the, th the, the main things we need to discuss. Uh, this is one of the purpose of this workshop. So, um, Leila. Okay, um, in my presentation, I discussed the, mainly the combined uh, PDO and MO backgrounds. So one uh, thing that I would like to see, uh, and I was even talking with some people in the cough breaks, uh, is if the main characteristics of the monsoon uh, that is related not only with the, the South Atlantic Convergence Zone, but the position of the high, the position of the trough, and so on, that mo main characteristics that were discussed in the first day, if they changed between at least these two uh, backgrounds that are discussed in more detail. I think that this is one point that should be uh, should be observations or models? We discussed uh, this yes. uh, in the morning. Mm -hmm. Right. Both. Because you, you, you uh, Leila discussed the position of the South Atlantic convergence on, okay? And right. yes. So this already has been done, oh. okay? And other uh, studies that can be done is considering other uh, higher frequency variability modes but it's not exactly related with monsoon, but could cause also uh, precipitation in the monsoon area, like, uh, sorry, uh, like uh, the variation of uh, frontal systems that can cause uh, precipitation in, in southeast, uh, southeastern Brazil, for, for instance, um, and so on. I think that there are a, a lot of uh, research that can be done um, Considering uh, the these low frequency backgrounds. So what you are suggesting is to uh, study the, the ah, okay, thank you. To study the oscillations of basic features of the monsoon related with these mm -hmm. slow oscillations, right. slow interdecadal oscillations, right. besides right. precipitation. Besides. So, yeah. 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 so yeah. we could uh, choose some mm -hmm. uh, basic features, some basic aspects, Perfect. such as yes. the South Atlantic conversion zone, yeah. uh, even the South Atlantic high, uh, uh, Bolivian high. high right. Yeah. Right. Uh -huh. right. Right. And then see how these basic features of the monsoon um, change right. with these interdecadal, very mm. low frequency oscillations. Right. Okay, okay, yeah, I think it's a, it's a good suggestion because then perhaps we could compose different pictures uh, of the monsoon in uh, different opposite phases, not just precipitation, but different yeah. pictures right. of the aspects of the monsoon. Yeah. So we showed several maps, uh, average conditions of the monsoon, mm -hmm. but we could do these maps for different uh, phases yeah. of uh, right. low frequency. Well, for this, we need to know which uh, kind of data we can use because for the multidecadal we need at least how 50 years or more. Yeah. Well, um, the analysis that uh, I showed, uh, I consider a long time of, of uh, a long period of time, but 
the papers that I sh showed that confirms uh, uh, the, my results is based on the 1979 up to now. In this period, we have one phase of warm PDO, cold, uh, warm uh, AMO, cold PDO, and cold AMO, warm PDO. That is exactly uh, reversed uh, conditions. So I think that is good. Two phases. I'm talking about simultaneous occurrence of uh, AMO and PDO backgrounds. <laughs> yeah, because we have war now we are under warm AMO and cold PDO. In the first period, the, the previous period, we were in the cold AMO and warm PDO. Okay? Yeah, there are uh, so to compose uh, different combinations of, uh, of contributions to the background from different modes of variability. And so I, th yeah, I, I think there's a nice uh, connection to the paleoclimate uh, work. Uh, something that I didn't stress in my presentation is the fact that the time resolution of the uh, proxies, primarily the speleothems in caves, is very high. In most of these cases in South America, now you have uh, annual two years resolution. In other words, decadal periods you can actually uh, identify from the speleothems. Um, given the fact that uh, now there's a network of uh, people uh, exchanging information of uh, speleothems uh, in different uh, continents, um, it's not very difficult to make comparisons of uh, teleconnection patterns, mm -hmm. right? Yeah. And that's something that I would encourage people to do. To do. The other point is, uh, of course, look at the model simulations, see if the model simulations preserve the structure that uh, we have been observing in the observational work. In other words, the paleoclimatic right. uh, proxies. Uh, and uh, finally, I think this uh, issue about the long decadal and longer variability and the connections with the stratosphere. It's something that we have continuously um, almost ignored in the last uh, 10, 20 years. There are some papers, but not a whole lot, making this connection between the stratosphere and troposphere. I think part of the reason perhaps is related to something that I think, Marcelo, yesterday you talked about uh, connectivity, didn't you? Um, is the fact that uh, when you look at the time series, of the sun-driven anomalies, like including the solar activity, it's a highly nonlinear time series. And uh, then when you look at papers trying to connect solar variability to climate variability here, it's almost always based on uh, correlation analysis. It's the first moment. So you don't, you're not actually capturing the the uh, possible nonlinear uh, connections. So I would encourage people to, uh, in these uh, long-term connections, to avoid the use of linear techniques, because you're probably going to miss important connections which are due to nonlinear processes. Okay. Uh, I. Um I think uh, m most of my presentation was based on an attempt of using observations. And we, here in, in South America, we have our data so biased uh, because all towards uh, Eastern South America and not at the core of the monsoon. Do we really know what's going on at the core of the monsoon and other contributions uh, from the low-level jet or all the mechanisms <coughs> we have been talking about here? And I, I just want to, including ocean, uh, um, uh, atmospheric, um, 
and land, you, land uh, and atmosphere uh, coupling interactions. So we don't really understand this very well, and I feel like we are about to, it's about time that we should really consider having an experiment in 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 America in South America this the South American uh, uh, monsoon experiment the same so we we would have it's about time that we 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 get together um, in Latin America maybe bring people from North America as well and have an experiment so we can answer some of these questions uh, more at the core of the monsoon in the region where we don't have data basically in fact, um, after the LBA program in the Amazon in the late uh, 90s and the early 2000s, we put a lot of effort in uh, trying to convince GWEX and Cliver uh, for the need of a um, South American monsoon experiment under VAMOS. Uh, it was called the LPB program, La Plata Basin program, uh, which uh, didn't reach the size that we anticipated at that time. Part of the plan was to have field experiment. Actually, South Jax in 2003 was the first of a series of experiments that did not happen. So after South Jax, there was nothing else in the same direction. It's about time, as you mentioned, to go back to this uh, issue. Um, of course, uh, hard times now. Everybody is uh, running short of money. Uh, on the other hand, uh, data availability, I think it's much better now. We have a, a nice um, uh, automatic uh, uh, network of uh, surface observations. We have... Uh, Lots of radars. We have uh, radars from the Amazon to central Brazil to uh, Minas Gerais and southeastern Brazil. Uh, the data is there. So we have more operational data than we had 15 years ago. More independent. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> I would like to follow up with... Uh, Alela and uh, Pedro's suggestion. I, I think uh, now uh, the diff. I, in my view, the difference between then and the now is the entire uh, climate Earth system commu community now have a better appreciation of the importance of interaction between biosphere, atmosphere, ocean. So uh, we have a more Earth system. Uh, 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 Earth system. Uh, sorry, view. sorry to interrupt. We have, but our governments don't. <laughs> right. Yes, but the, we are talking about international climate. Uh, so, uh, yeah, the political environment is not uh, uh, good for this kind of a field campaign. But um, from scientific point of view, the community have a much better appreciation of the importance of SAM. And having related to that is I would like to uh, just uh, uh, comment on the uh, importance of uh, using paleo record as well as uh, instrument record today to understand the role of the vegetation. So we have this massive rainforest that, provi that controls energy water cycle uh, at least over the South American, and in the uh, using today's instrument data, like land use, has a noticeable effect on the onset and demise of the wet season. That's being showed by uh, observation uh, as well as model in the paleo time, and whether the response of a rainforest to this global forcing has really uh, amplified the impact at the local scale, which in turn affect the paleo record. I think that's an element also, uh, it's a very important element for understand the SAM and the South American, in uh, tropical South American in general. I think both the paleo study and the today's the contemporary study could contribute to understanding of the effect of the rainforest.
Um, there were, uh, okay. Uh, well, um, going back to these interannual uh, time scales, um, uh, well, we saw, uh, summarizing uh, the, uh, the talk, the, uh, from the point of the view of the mechanisms of these impacts, uh, the importance, which is already well known, of teleconnections, uh, tropic, uh, tropics, 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 extra tropics, as well as local uh, SST influence uh, nearer to the to the coast. So these are mechanisms that are. Huh? Yeah, yeah, but I'm coming coming to that. <laughs> so uh, these are mechanisms that are uh, well well known, uh, although there are there is still much to to be uh, discovered uh, in this uh, regard. Uh, but then I th I think that uh, an important mechanism uh, mechanism uh, shaping this uh, impact. In the peak monsoon season, which is this question of the relationship between the beginning of the rainy season and the spring and the peak summer, and this uh, interaction, this surface atmosphere interaction that is able to, to shape this impact in uh, a big region uh, in Central East Brazil, uh, this kind of study, uh, I, I think, should be extended because these interactions are at the heart, heart of, of the monsoon functioning. These interactions, uh, uh, heat fluxes, uh, uh, latent heat, sensible heat fluxes, uh, influence of topography, all these questions are very important for uh, in monsoon systems. So if we um, know better this kind of interactions, we are also uh, learning a lot uh, about the system itself. Uh, and uh, this kind of uh, interactions, uh, which have been already studied, uh, especially here in Central, uh, in Central uh, East uh, Brazil or Central East South America, uh, could be extended also to some other spots. Uh, uh, over the, the continent that could also have uh, a role uh, in uh, generating through surface atmosphere interaction uh, some kinds of uh, more regional circulations that uh, uh, help explaining some uh, observed uh, phenomena. Yeah, I think this is very important because when you look at the MGO, for instance, from a global characteristics, the, connect, the impact of the MGO on a regional basis is very much dependent on these factors. In other words, the coupling of the local response to the MGO, large-scale MGO forcing, is dependent on these local processes. Yeah, exactly. right? uh, you have the MGO forcing, but you have also local conditions that can favor the development, the intensification of this impact, uh, force it from uh, remote, uh, 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 well, sources. Uh, so, uh, yes, uh, this is something that, uh, well, when I, I talked about this intraseasonal variability, when I, I, I talked about this intraseasonal variability generated by surface atmosphere interaction, which I did not have time to show uh, yesterday. Uh, actually, it's these mechanisms, I, I show it today, because these mechanisms within the monsoon region generates uh, um, an intraseasonal variability. So it's uh, uh, an oscillation with about 120 day period. In fact, there, there is a lot of uh, theoretical uh, evidences of the connectivity between the diurnal cycle and the intraseasonal, mm -hmm. both from the point of view of um, analyzing models and from a strictly uh, theoretical point of view. And the diurnal variability is the one 
that is immediately connected to this kind of surface forcing. Mm -hmm. Like yes. the diurnal variation is fundamentally dependent on the Bowen ratio. Mm -hmm. And the Bowen ratio depends on the soil moisture. Uh, what about uh, multi-decadal uh, in the North American monsoon? Teresa is there? Hongfu? <laughs> Uh, because we are talking about, well, we talk about the multidecadal variability, interseasonal variability, interannual variability. Uh, in South uh, American monsoon, we have many studies. And what about uh, uh, new or further studies in the North American monsoon? Uh, there are uh, several studies that have uh, um, related uh, monsoon rainfall with, uh, first of all, El Nino Southern Oscillation. Winter precipitation is linked to El Nino. And uh, summer precipitation is linked to La Nina. But that changes because there is, um, it depends on the phase of the Pacific decadal oscillation. If they are in phase, whatever influence uh, that is in place is stronger. But if they are opposite, the, the signal is weaker. That's one thing that's related with the Pacific Ocean. With the um, Atlantic Ocean, um, there are studies that have uh, analyzed the Atlantic multidecadal oscillation and that uh, influences the intensity of the North Atlantic high and, of course, the SSTs and the tropical cyclones. When the AMO is in positive phase, which is warm, the Atlantic is warm, there is more rainfall that can arrive to the eastern side of the U.S. and Mexico because of tropical cyclones, etc. But all the western side is dry. Most of the, the most, some of the most important drought conditions in, in uh, Southwest United States and Northwestern Mexico are uh, related with the positive AMO. So more rainfall in the North American monsoon is related with the negative AMO. And tomorrow in my talk, I will talk a little bit uh, about that. But uh, there are not too many stories. We need more stories on the North American monsoon. Yeah, this is what we need. Uh, further studies in this kind of uh, relation. Yes, and, and also because there are several studies that have shown that the uh, um, Hadley cell has amplified. And we, we have uh, uh, negative trends in, ter in uh, precipitation and possibly some of these trends are linked to the uh, expansion of the Hadley cell, but we haven't done any. It, it is just a supposition mm -hmm. uh, that we need to study that uh, in order to understand better the factors. Mm -hmm. Just one, one comment um, that we also need to understand more these um, teleconnections with, uh, because we've been so focused on what's happening in the Southern Hemisphere but these interactions with, uh, with uh, even uh, weather systems from the northern hemisphere. So the northern hemisphere influencing uh, the southern hemisphere, hemisphere through, towards uh, the ITCZ, right? Modulation of the ITCZ <laughs> by um, uh, 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 um, <laughs> wave trains in the northern hemisphere, basically. We have talked about this. I think this is an important aspect because of course, this uh, 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 modulate the ATCZ, and so it could also influence the monsoon on on many time scales, not only uh, synoptic scales. Uh, well, we had also the short talks of uh, regional vari precipitation variability. So uh, start here. Yeah, only a little suggestion that this um, 
I think that um, an important point of view is um, how extreme events are modulated by the different combination of AMO, PDO, or interannual variability like uh, North uh, Atlantic Oscillation or ENSO. So this is a um, challenge to uh, see how this combination modulate extreme events to improve the predictability of forecast or early warning flag system, for, for example. Ah, it's a little suggestion. Yeah, also I think, uh, well, in, in, in my in my presentation, I, I, I think it's, it was missing what I, what I was trying to do. Uh, I, I, I missed to say that, uh, is it possible for the models, for the um, reanalysis databases to represent what is going on? Because if we want to rely on this models we need to assess uh, you know permanently how are they doing because uh, on, on the one hand they are changing models reanalysis are improving but at the same time surface observations also are changing because there are in, in some parts of uh, South America they are disappearing so we need to take care of this uh, challenge for for surface observations meteorology. And I think adding on to what you both said, like we do need to understand better how or maybe where the climate models are maybe failing to reproduce all these mechanisms that are important to the to the monsoon system and the conversion zone, either for representation of our climate or extreme and also the trends in the future. Um, any other comment for this uh, day? in this uh, subjects we discussed. So then <laughs> I think that's time. And uh, on, as I said, on Friday, we'll have all these um, comments, discussions, and we, uh, we present here. And uh, if you want to say something, you can, and you don't want to say, but you you can write to us in Portuguese or Spanish or English, <laughs> and uh, we can include here. If you think something is missing or something you would like to to develop uh, uh, or you have some idea, you can write and send to us. Okay, thank you. So tomorrow we'll see you again. <laughs>